everybody. My name is Frank Lyman. I'm working for WSO2 as a systems architect. And in parallel, I'm also a professor of, uh, for middleware and software engineering at the University of Stuttgart in uh, Germany. And before that, I was for 20 years an IBM a distinguished engineer working on all middleware products at IBM. And we also have Srinath. Srinath? Hi, Eva. So I'm Srinath, Srinath Perro. Oh. Uh, so I work as the uh, Vice President of Research at WSO2. Um, so I work uh, across different teams, uh, mainly on the architecture uh, and the platform uh, level design. Frank, over to you. Okay. So I will cover the first part uh, of our presentation today. Uh, the subject will be on the outer architecture of microservices. Um, and what I would like to start with is to remind you what are the causes of volatility in synchronous communication. That means RPC. And what you see here as a reminder, um, first of all, uh, synchronous communication comes with a time dependency, like in a phone call. That means all communication partners have to be available at the same time because otherwise they don't communicate with each other. Next is a dependency in the terms of format of the data to be exchanged. If you think about remote method invocation, for example, the numbers and types of the parameters that the client passes to a server must match exactly. And if this changes, right, the, the client is basically broken. Also, there is a reference dependency. That means uh, the client knows from the very beginning with which program to communicate. Often they even know the uh, hard code, the, uh, the address. That means if this changes, again, client is breaking. And there is a dependency in terms of platform. That means client and server, the client often needs to understand what the platform is the server is communicating with. For example, if you are passing uh, a, a strings, you need to be aware what the language, uh, what the code page of the client is versus the code page of the server. You need to understand if bad comes to worth about little Indian and big Indian, although uh, the last dependency gets a little bit weaker because more and more middleware in the RPC space is hiding that for you. But at least the other dependencies are remaining. And this, this is tight coupling, right? Because if you change uh, the time uh, order, if you change for, uh, parameters, right, you are basically breaking. So client and server in synchronous communication are really tightly coupled. So loose coupling, loose coupling reduces the number of assumptions that two parties that want to communicate with each other uh, have when they are exchanging information. And this is what we want to have in order to write applications that are very stable in contrast to when they use synchronous communication. So what is the loose coupling? We define that now by negating uh, the volatility aspects we saw before. So loose coupling typically is defined with these four autonomy dimensions that you see. So loose coupling means that you are autonomous in terms of references. That means the producer and consumer of um, data that are exchanged don't know each other. And time autonomy means that, well, you can exchange, you can work at your own pace. A client can send requests out without a server immediately processing them, and the server can process um, the request uh, independently when the client is sending it. Format autonomy means that that client and server, producer and consumer, can use different formats of the data exchanged. And platform autonomy at last means, well, uh, the client and the server can be implemented in completely different programming languages, can uh, run on completely different environments. So this is loose coupling and your, your, your applications become much, much stabler uh, than before. So the first aspect is, well, loose coupling is known in reliable method queuing since four or well, at least four decades. And the uh, uh, SOA, or the service only architecture, is also relying or is, is bringing loose coupling to a services world. Why is that? So reference autonomy is achieved because a client 
interacts in SOA with an endpoint that is most often represented as a URI, but not with a concrete program. That means the, the client interacts with the URI and does not even know what kind of program, which implementation is behind the endpoint the client is interacting with. Time autonomy in SOA is achieved in at least two different manners. First of all, you, we all know that the WSDL binding allows you to specify asynchronous bindings so that communication then takes place via message queuing, for example, JMS. Or you can follow uh, patterns that have been established in SOAP. You can add reply to header, correlation header in order to support asynchronous communication even via synchronous transports. Right? And this is, there rings a bell if you are aware about enterprise application integration patterns. Right? They basically taught that and this has been brought to standards like SOAP. Format autonomy, well, format autonomy comes with uh, the bindings that you see in WSDL where you can specify the serialization format of messages to be sent from a client to a server or between two communication partners. And then middleware like an enterprise service bus then will do the transformation invisibly while the message is in transit um, along the wire. And platform autonomy obviously comes into the place because the, at the heart of SOA, uh, we, uh, the uh, programming languages are basically abstracted, right? Client and server the communication partners don't know the hosting environment of, of each other, the programming language they're written in and so on. So loose coupling is, 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 has been implemented uh, from day one on in service-oriented architecture. But what about the other approach to a service-oriented architecture, namely the REST-based architecture? First of all, I'm going to remind you what the underpinnings uh, of REST is, namely the characteristics of the web architecture. First of all, also in the web architecture, all interaction between communication partners is based on URIs. As you go to URI address resources. And um, in, in, the REST, uh, in, in the REST architecture, like in the web, you have four major methods, namely get, post, put, and delete. Get allows you to retrieve information. Post allows you to create uh, new resources. Uh, put allows updates and delete allows, well, no surprise, deletion. Finally, in the web architecture, you have a standard data format, namely all the MIME types, and uh, very often you exchange data information based, uh, that are encoded in HTML, XML, JSON, but again, as I said before, all MIME types are valid uh, types for information to be exchanged. And Interactions in the web architecture, which is the underpinning of REST, is that interactions are stateless. That means uh, one interaction or one exchange of information can typically not point to uh, past exchanges. That basically means, which is the last bullet on the slide, that all context of an interaction must be fully understandable from the message itself. Right? And you all no, uh, you're all familiar with cookies, for example, you are rewriting. Uh, these are all techniques that basically achieve that. So, based uh, with this underpinnings of web architecture, uh, we will now see that the REST architectural style, which is, so to speak, in parallel to the SOA architectural style, in fact, does support loose coupling. So, what does that mean? Uh, here you see a figure. The reference autonomy in REST basically says, well, a client communicates with a URI. And this URI decouples a client from having to know what the actual function implementation is. Because when you communicate with the URI, there is a proxy for what we call on this slide a REST server. Right? There are pieces of code here called REST implementations that basically uh, get delegated the incoming message and the and the proxy behind the URI has the intelligence to do the pro proper routing, but the client doesn't know at all what the actual implementation is, which was at the heart of reference autonomy. And we will see in a few minutes that hate OS, which is another important principle in the REST architecture, goes even beyond beyond that. Time autonomy, well, time autonomy in REST allows you to deal with uh, long-running requests because sometimes uh, when you make a REST call, um, what you kick off is a processing that may take some time, especially when you pause or when you delete 
um, uh, resources on the web that may initiate complete business processes, which may take uh, minutes, hours, or even days, or even longer. What happens in this case is, right, your server just acknowledges the reception of the request. It does not immediately respond with the result. It just says, okay, I received the request, and it does so by specifying, uh, by giving you an HTTP status code 202 accepted back. And in the, in the very same message, what you get is you have another field called the content location header, and the content location header is a URL that points to what is called in the REST architectural style a task resource. And this task resource reports what the actual state of the long-running request is. And the URL that you got passed by in as, as the value of the content location header field can be used by you as a client in succeeding gets uh, to learn what the actual status basically is. And finally, your get will basically receive a message saying, well, the long-running request succeeded. Here's the URL where you can get um, the response. Format autonomy in REST is, well, uh, comes with, um, uh, because REST most often is uh, realized uh, based on HTTP, HTTPS, so often you have entities, entities in abstract work for the resources in different variants, so these entities may be in different languages, if you transport text like English, German, you have different encodings for pictures like GIF, JPEGs, JPEG, PNGs, you have different qualities of, of the information. For example, you get colored picture, black and white pictures in order to accommodate different line and connection speeds. And you have even different formats if you're only interested in data exchange itself, be, be that the data is um, represented in XML, RDF, JSON, and that like. And HTTP, but the very different, at this heart of, of, of HTTP, we have something that's called content negotiation. That means HTTP defines procedures to negotiate all the different variants that I mentioned before, uh, what the client uh, sends to the server, what the client receives from the server, and so on. So it's built into HTTP native, and REST being based on HTTP basically inherits that the ability to uh, negotiate on the format to be exchanged between client and server. Finally, platform autonomy. Platform autonomy is inherited because uh, uh, REST is based on HTTP, HTTPS, and HTTP clients and servers are available in all major environments. And the programs uh, uh, that, uh, that are written in different languages, right, they can exchange HTTP messages because you have framework for each of the different languages these days in place. So I mentioned a few minutes ago hate OS. Hate OS increases the reference autonomy uh, in the REST architecture style further. Hate OS is an acronym, as you can see. It means hypermedia as the engine of application state. And what that means is that the, the client is even further decoupled from the individual function that the client interacts with because the service um, passes back to a client, the state of the state, the, the functions that could be invoked in the actual state of the interaction. So what that means is, you make as a client a call to a REST API, and what you get back is you get back a list of URLs that represent other APIs that could be invoked next. That means you as a client, you learn after you change the state of a resource what are the next valid operations you can perform on that. So you're not only decoupled in terms of what are the programs that I'm going to invoke, but, but, the, but in the REST architecture style allows you even, even to learn new APIs, which is very, very excellent for uh, performing versioning in REST. So as a summary of that, there is a well-established maturity model for REST implementation, referred to as the Richardson maturity model, according to the person who invented that. If you take a look at the bottom of the slide, um, uh, you see level zero maturity is, well, you use HTTP only as your transport, you only have a single URL where all messages of your application are sent to, and this URI basically is used with a single method 
namely uh, the post HTTP verb. This is what XML RPC or SOAP basically does foster. You use a post to a, to a URL. Behind the URL is a piece of code that interprets the body of the HTTP message which is SOAP and then the, the processor understands the action verb and so on. So REST people hate it of course. And in level one, the level one maturity says, well, you have individual resources identified. You know that you are manipulating, uh, for example, customers and accounts and so on. Still, you use a single post method. And, uh, but this method now is invoked with individual resources. Right? You basically ask the post method uh, to process a certain customer. This is similar to an object world. You invoke a single method on particular resources, i.e. objects. The level two and now REST people become more comfortable, says, well, now you also use appropriate HTTP methods. That means if you want to update the customer, for example, you use the put method. If you want to create a new customer, you, could, you use the post method, and so on. And in your responses, you use HTTP status code, codes as well as headers. That means you make a lot use of all the machinery behind REST. You enable caching, you enable uh, uh, scalability, and so on. And REST people are really glad if you use a hate OS, then uh, you are at level three. Uh, in practice, um, level three hyper uh, means hate OS is only rarely used. And the main reason is because mm, it's not well understood how to write programs that really make use of the advices which function to, to, to use next. But uh, a bunch of APIs are at level two. Uh, more APIs are only level one. So if you have a vendor that is using level two, then you have then you uh, have already a very good vendor, right? That, that, that if a vendor allows you to use level two APIs. Now we come to the main subject. Finally, uh, microservices. So I think you are interested in microservices, and most of you have seen the blog by Martin Fowler. And, and, and one of his colleagues on microservices, Sam Newman, has uh, written a very fine book about building microservices, giving some experiences, although the technology is new on the market. So he basically built a few microservices and basically reports what lessons learned. So let's dive into a famous definition uh, by uh, Martin Fowler. Uh, Martin Fowler, and here's now a quote literally taken from the website. Uh, micro, uh, Martin basically as well a microservice. The microservice architectural style is an approach to developing a single application as a suite of small services, each running in its own process and communicating with lightweight mechanism often use HTTP resource APIs. The definition, the quote continues, and Martin says further, these services are built around business capabilities and are independently deployable by fully automated deployment machinery. And finally, we conclude the quote, uh, there is a bare minimum of centralized management of these services, which may be uh, written in different programming languages and use different data storage technologies. So the next slide basically abstracts this quote from the web, and I summarize it and say, okay, a microservice is small, a microservice runs in its own process, and I'm saying here, well, these days we will also add, well, a microservice may run in its own container. A microservice communicates often via HTTP, is built around business capabilities, written in different program languages, uses different data storage technologies, and is independent deployed by fully automated deployment machinery. So my comments on that is, well, what the hell does small mean? So small means, does it mean huh, that the service does not, it doesn't have to wait too much. Is the footprint in main memory a small? Is the footprint in uh, on, on this small? What the hell does small really mean? Next, um, the, the fact that the microservice should run its own process, well, this is true for many services, right? They run in their own process or in their own container. The same is true for HTTP. Many services are reachable via uh, HTTP, and in fact, most, if not nearly all, of the REST services are available via HTTP. 
And the next three bullets, well, being built around business capabilities, written in different programming languages, using different data storage technology, well, that's what services are all about. This is why services have been invented. But the last thing, this is what I basically find very interesting, or this is what many people find interesting. So if you compare the comments on the abstracted uh, definition of the microservices here, what is left over is the essence, a microservice, is a service that is independently deployable by fully automated deployment machinery. So microservice, first of all, is a service. And if we find something interesting that comes new with microservices is this independent deployability. And this independent deployability has very fine and interesting implications in terms of scalability and so on. So here's a problem that many people say is at the heart of the term microservices. Right, you have a big application on the left side and you want to scale and, and, and you want to replicate this application because you want to scale and you want to ensure the high availability, elasticity and so on. Well, but if you replicate this monolith, what you do is you have to pay penalty this because all the componentry of the application is replicated over and over again. That means if you have an Oracle here and an MP series or and so on, right, you all have to pay for each of the copy of the application the license fees, for example. So you pay a lot of penalty if your service is huge, huge in the sense that it consists out of a bunch of, of, of different components that you need to pay license fees for. So how do we solve that? The solution is, what a surprise, you split your big application, the monolith, into smaller granules, and these smaller granules can be deployed independently. So now I remove the boundary, I split the application into microservices, right? Microservices, as I, as I said before, services that are independently deployable, and as a result, you can now replicate individual pieces, the squares, the triangles, the diamonds, and so on, that basically means if it turns out that this hexagon here is a bottleneck that you need to scale it, you only replicate the hexagon a couple of times and you only need to pay the penalties for in terms of license fees, for example, to pay for these red hexagons, but the other components don't need to be replicated. And if only, only the diamonds must scale or the circles must scale, you only uh, replicate them. And you can do so because each of the components that are now microservices can be deployed independently. That means replication, as I said before, of the component that may become bottlenecks uh, in, in introduces scale, or the components may be critical, so you replicate them, you lay them out redundantly to achieve high availability without paying the penalties that otherwise you would have to pay if you would replicate the whole big monolith. So the essence of microservices uh, is, well, it's all about proper granularity of components, independent deployment. What uh, microservices is not, is not at all a counter proposal to SOA, and microservices especially do not prove that SOA failed in the opposite. They require, if you go back to Martin's website, loose coupling. This is why we uh, have, sp have spoken for some 10 minutes about loose coupling. And, they, and this is now a key important, they require methodology to determine the proper granules. As I said in the second line, microservices have a proper granularity. So you re, they require some methodology to, de to de determine sorry, the proper granularity. But this is the holy grail of software engineering for decades. There is no answer how to determine proper granularity. So that means you don't expect from your middleware vendor to give you advices on something that is seeped for since three or four decades in software engineering, but microservice architectural style is all about you to solve a difficult architectural design problem. But your Microsoft, but your, but your middleware vendor can help you with the infrastructure to host the microservices. They can help you with implementing your microservice that what we uh, WSO2 are doing, it, as, as, you may, as you may have heard in the first webinar, and that you will hear in the webinars that follow after that what uh, uh, Srinath and I try to pass over to you. So I would like to pass over to Srinath 
would, who is going to introduce to you what that means for you to develop uh, microservices from scratch. Trina, please go ahead. So, what do I have to do? Trina? Uh, hello, Frank. Hello. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I, I, so, I, uh, Frank, I'll talk from your slides, but uh, until or so now. So, okay. so I think, uh, so we talk about what my services means and why it is useful, but there are few things Okay, all these are great and good, but when you try to do it actually on your design, this means several things. So, so what I'm going to do is trying to point out some uh, some things that change when you try to do microservices, and try to work through uh, what are the accept, accepted solution for each of these cases. And Frank, could you switch the slide for the next one? Uh, I thought that you have the new slides, Trina. Uh, so, Frank, no, I I need to hand over the uh, the present device. Okay, yes. Yeah, so. so you have not presented, right? No, I I got it now actually. So. Ah, okay, perfect. Okay, sorry about that. So, uh, okay. Uh, so, so the first thing, maybe the first surprise, if you are trying to do microservices, is that you are not supposed to share the two microservices. Not supposed to share the same database. So, and so, uh, like for example, when you do SOA, so. Generally, you try to avoid that, but you might still do this. But microservices, I think this is one of the first rules that you are not, you shouldn't share data through a database. And in my opinion, this is advice that you should follow because that kind of sharing adds the coupling between these services. And if a one service change its schema, the other one would break, so on and so forth. However, this adds more problems because, like for example, if you want to want stronger consistency, right? So, for example, if you want to uh, do the update the database from two places or see uh, uh, read the data that write by another service, now you need to uh, do it through services. Uh, because you now you can't talk to the same database. What that means is you might have to do distributed transaction, at least the most simple solution. So, uh, uh, so, so for that case, the standard solution, general accepted solution, is that uh, is to use two databases. And if the updates are only, if the changes are done only into one database, uh, you could use uh, uh, asynchronous messaging, like for example JMSQ, to transfer your updates from one, when you do the updates to one database, you can transfer it to the other database and uh, other service. So, uh, so they stay loosely coupled. Uh, but uh, they would work uh, as they expect. However, if the, both the services go and update the database, now uh, you can't do what uh, the message queue, as we just talked about. Uh, they, actually, if that is happening, you should, uh, one thing is you should look back at your two microservices, and it could be that they should be a single service. So uh, if you actually, I have given a link which goes through this in a lot of detail because uh, the, 
the idea is that with the microservice, you uh, one microservice cover one use case, and if you go into too fine granularity, that might mean uh, that you you can't decouple it because there are these kind of couplings. Now, uh, now this might make sense in some cases, but some cases, if you continue like that, like adding all the dependency into single microservices, you might end up with the one big uh, application, which is what we are trying to avoid. Right? So then, uh, uh, so so when you get to that situation. Uh, what you need to do is, uh, so uh, there are several solutions. So the one solution is that you try to uh, design your experience such a way that um, uh, you don't have to do transactions. Okay? So, so now the problem is that uh, you have two microservices. They both update the data, right? And uh, so they both update the data, but it does not make sense to add them into a single service, right? So the one main idea is that you could relax a lot of guarantees, right? For example, you could have a timeout. You, instead of doing transactions, you could have a timeout. And then basically you, you, uh, you carry out without a transaction, knowing that uh, your timeout would uh, cover the case if uh, something fails, right? Also, uh, uh, like sometimes you could use like persistent queues, etc. So, so and uh, sometimes you could uh, use compensation. It's like uh, the idea of compensation is that I'm not doing transaction, but if something goes wrong, I would go and fix it, right? So actually, if you think about that, uh, like even with SOA, uh, we. The, we, we use transactions, but not very, very often, because the transactions, as you would know, is something very, very expensive. However, I do not agree the, with the fact that, because uh, some people uh, believe that you could remove the need for all the all kind of transactions. But I, uh, I believe there may still some, there are some cases where you must do transactions. And those cases, uh, you can't help it. So, uh, so, so I think regarding transactions and regarding not sharing the database, uh, the what I'm saying is that uh, you should avoid it as much as possible because if you do avoid it, you end up with a more looser, couple, simpler system. However, there may be very specific use cases there you still want to do it. Okay, so let's switch to the next topic. So when you do uh, microservices, uh, one of the idea is that the, all the APIs you do are forward compatible, right? So which means that uh, each service can accept inputs uh, intended for the later versions of that service, right? Uh, so, so the 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 idea of doing that is that if you have the forward compatibility, and uh, the any dependencies, any other applications or services that use your service could evolve. Right, without having you to change the service. So basically, remove the coupling between the uh, applications and they could evolve, right? Uh, so, uh, so that's a very great idea, right? However, there are a few things you need to uh, careful about because uh, it's a good idea to do explicit API version so that you know at least what you are getting, etc. And some because the to avoid that you unwittingly process a request that you cannot process. Uh, also, I think uh, you can't continue to support uh, the all the versions forever. 
of course I think uh, at some point you need to draw the line and stop uh, doing that right but uh, but but the, as I can say this idea gives you the uh, different microservices that means different themes that work on those microservices to evolve fast and release and uh, build their systems much faster okay the third one is the microservices security right so if we think about the, our uh, the old model, rather SOA and earlier uh, approaches, the client would send a request into the service, right? Uh, the service would either check a database or talk to identity server, like it could be LDAP, etc., and it will check for authentication and authorization, right? Uh, so, um, so in uh, in general, this is discouraged under microservices uh, because uh, you try to avoid cross communication between services. Now, the, again, the, that avoiding cross communication, we'll come back to this topic again later. Also, is a uh, it's a little bit uh, it's not a very very clear cut thing. I think there are maybe some situations that you would want to still do the cross communication however the more cross communication you have the tighter couple the system would be so uh, the less you have the better right so uh, to avoid the cross communication uh, the one proposed approach uh, from microservices uh, based systems is that the client would directly first talk to the identity server Okay, it cannot be the database obviously because we can't give the access to the client to go to the database. It has to be some identity server. Client would talk to the identity server, get a token, and send that token with the request into the microservice, which could uh, authenticate and authorize the call. So. Uh, uh, so the example of these tokens are SAML tokens and OAuth tokens. Uh, however, if you are doing uh, OAuth tokens, uh, it would actually need need, uh, need your I, the service to check back with the identity server in at least in some scenarios. So which little bit break the model, but with the SAML tokens, it will work. Uh, uh, cleanly. So uh, actually, uh, if you go into this uh, article, it uh, talk about some of these choices in a lot of detail. Now, uh, I would consider, like for example, not sharing a database is like a where I would highly recommend that. Uh, now, this level of uh, microservices, like doing the security this style, I think, you know, in my opinion, is preferred. But I think you need to take look at your scenario and take a decision whether uh, are you are going to allow a little bit of cross communication or take the, at the at the complexity of doing tokens etc uh, so uh, so that's a trade off that you need to make uh, so the next question is a uh, composition uh, with uh, with microservices so let's first talk about how do you Compose with SOA. Now the idea is that the main idea behind SOA is that I would take my different functionalities in my organization, in my system, and break them into series of services, right? Uh, now then, but the generally client would want to do something, and what we do is we would place a orchestration server which could be an enterprise service bus or a workflow engine so etc which would accept the client request right and then it would talk to different services and uh, carry out those executions whatever needed do carry out those uh, execution and return the result for the client okay so uh, However, with the microservices model, 
this uh, doing that model is generally discouraged. Again, this uh, uh, actually this is like very debatable topic, so I, I, I'll talk uh, more about that. But the, so in general, the the microservices uh, model would say don't use the ESP or a, a compression engine, right? Uh, because mainly again trying to avoid the cross communication and uh, going through a single point. However, it is not very very clear what is the alternative is, right? So the I think this uh, all in project topic there's like a lot of discussion happening. So one of the solutions that has been proposed is that you would hand over the responsibility of orchestrating and talking to different services and putting together the last reply, uh, last result you could delegate that into the client's application which would generally run in the browser right so actually like for example for some applications this had worked well so uh, the basic idea is that uh, like for example if you like if you take uh, like a website like Amazon, if you load the web page with a little bit of a slow network, you might see that some widgets get populated, some widgets would come a bit later, right? So, so I mean, so basically that's this idea where the browser would load and it will call to different services, pull the data, right, and put together uh, the final outcome that you uh, need to do. So for some applications that could actually work well, however there are a few other, uh, okay, so but there are a few complications if you are trying to do it, right? So uh, one is that actually if your client is behind a slower network, Instead, when the client, basically client would directly has to connect multiple clients through that slow network into your multiple services, right? While the earlier model would accept the client's request, but then do the orchestration directly, right? So also now you are keeping, you give the control of orchestration, basically control of carrying out different activities into the browser, which the client can take, get it into, right? So, and of course you can, by doing careful things, you could avoid the client hacking it, but the, your security concerns become harder because, because you actually put together the final result within the client browser, which, uh, which the client has full control over. Okay, so uh, the examples of this model, right, composition at the browser, uh, the examples we have seen now mostly for websites, which are reasonably simple, uh, in the sense, the architecturally, right, those, uh, they are like, they are complicated systems, like they are MSMX, they are complicated systems, but uh, the, they are for websites, but it's not really clear how that would use for other client of client sector. Also, finally, if this uh, compression lead to some state, now this lay, state lead, lead, uh, leaves in the client's browser, uh, at least for some time, which may be a problem, right? So, uh, I think the, the conclusion is that so, uh, at least on the PO microservice model, the using ESP, etc., is discouraged. Now, if your application can do that without too much complication, it's a good thing because again, you have a uh, loose more, more loose coupling. However, you need to think whether the drawbacks I went through are they are would they affect the affect your scenarios significantly right so and the, the alternative proposals are they are like for example this idea of API gateway 
but that's pretty much the same approach as the S2A approach because at the end of the day you have a central orchestration. Okay, uh, so uh, so I went through uh, uh, like I, I try to so uh, from my part what I try to do is pick up some of the uh, surprises you might get if you are trying to do the microservices architecture and give some ideas at least my my recommendations on what to some of these uh, are these are evolving concepts and some of the ground truths are people being uh, it's been established it's not very very clear so which I think that which means that you also need to use common sense also and think what that means in your scenario and uh, weigh the loose coupling versus the complexity uh, when you try to do it. Like for example, like uh, most, I would say most of the time it might, uh, it would be more costly to add distributed transactions than trying trying to break, break I mean if you have to uh, either add distributed transactions or keep two parts of this uh, as two services as one service, I would most probably go for one service, etc. Uh, so uh, uh, to conclude, so the uh, the idea of microservice, the main idea behind this loose coupling, right? So it's it's about figuring out the right granularity of your components, so that they could be developed, managed, uh, etc. Independently, right? So which is a very very powerful concept because now that would let Different teams that manage, uh, deploy um, uh, those uh, services to evolve independently, uh, which will be lead to huge cost savings, right? And finally, as I said before, it's an evolving concept. Some of the ground truths are there, but some people are uh, still debating what's the best approach, etc. So uh, you need to also think. Uh, what that means in your use case and uh, like act sensibly. Uh, so thanks very much. So uh, we can take any question. Uh, so uh, Frank, is there any question that you would like to take? So yeah, we have a bunch of questions. Yes. Uh, so the first question was and I think some of my responses already have been passed to Osama to the public. So should I give? Uh, can I give examples of HTTP verbs? So sorry for using this this term. So verb, HTTP verbs are the commands, the methods that HTTP does define. Uh, especially get, put, post, delete. But there are other methods that you have heard about, like head to ask metadata to to get metadata of a resource options to find out what the capabilities of the server are and so on. But the rest architectural style is basically using the four HV commands, get, put, post, delete. There was another question uh, on the rest architectural style. Let me scroll to them. Uh, there was a person, oh, there was a, rec uh, there was a, oh, it's moving too fast here. It was about, well, rest is over, uh, HTTP and HTTP based on TCP, what about UDP because many messaging or highly scalable messaging systems are using UDP. Well, so there are two responses from my side on, on, on this question. Yes, you are right, UDP allows you uh, for a higher throughput. But please keep in mind that we have huge REST implementations like, uh, like uh, the Amazon website, Google and so on. So they can sustain a whole uh, high throughput based on their backend architecture. But again, you are also right, this is the second part of my response. I'm aware of a bunch of customers that are implementing REST over the message queuing protocols, right? So REST is an architectural style. It's not at all coupled to HTTP, although in the public uh, it is always connected with HTTP, but I know implementations within enterprises that use message queuing which of course then are on top of, often on top of UDP. There was another question on REST HTTP. Uh, there was a late attendance, uh, a late at, uh, attendee that asked, well, did you mention time autonomy? Yes, I did mention time autonomy. The question was also, what about uh, patterns like correlation ID, 
request reply where I also mention these kinds of, of patterns that you know from the enterprise application integration world and you also have uh, in the SOAP world SOAP features that allow you to do that. Another question was, question coming in and somehow this calls, uh, oh, can you Frank share a couple of big apps currently changing or splitting into microservices? Well, I am aware, I, I, unfortunately I can't mention the name of the companies, but I'm, I'm, I'm aware that a few companies are doing that. I work with two of them. They are using a monolith and try to split it into microservices, but these projects are still ongoing. So as of now, I cannot say whether it was successful or not, but you may go to Martin Fowler's blog. He gives basically guidelines how to split monoliths into uh, microservices then you might also be, uh, I, and I may also mention there is another blog by Stefan Tilkov. Stefan Tilkov is running a company called InfoQ. They basically recommend not to do so. Right? So this is what Srinath said. There's a lot of fight and discussion going on how to build microservices. Uh, Fowler says always use a monolith to break it, break it apart. And there's another group on the web that says no, never break a monolith apart. Right? But I, as I said before, I work with two companies and I know more companies that are doing that. They are basically uh, started the endeavor uh, to break a monolith apart. Uh, was there another question on REST? On REST. Uh, uh, oh, there's a recent question coming in. How do you see the use of REST APIs versus messaging for microservice intercommunication? Which of these are preferred? Well, there's no simple answer, right? Because most of the REST APIs today are synchronous in nature, and you need to need to uh, uh, use, apply a bunch of patterns um, in order uh, to mimic uh, what you get in messaging for free. So there's really not a simple answer, but uh, it is an interesting question. So please send me a mail if you are interested to discuss that to frank at wso2.com in order to discuss this REST API versus messaging, because there's not a quick answer. So let me scroll for another REST-related API. No, I think Srinath... Uh, also, there's one API, one question, microservices always communicate REST APIs? Uh, n n no. Uh, according to the definition that you find most often in the web, well, it's about smallness, it's about lightweight protocols, right? So the very definition that people are currently discussing is not coupled uh, to REST, but there is a trend, a tendency uh, to see microservices very close to the REST world. But again, the principles of, of being a service that is independently deployable is applicable to each, any kind of, of other transport protocol and is not coupled immediately to the REST architecture style. But also, again, if you want to discuss that further, send a message to friend at frank at wso2.com. So I think textbook, yeah? I don't know, thank you. Yeah, so let the, me, I'll yeah. take like one or two, but I think others we we can discuss, please drop a okay. mail. Yes. So, so uh, one uh, sorry, the, I think one question was about WS transactions from SOA. So the, I think WS transactions were a great idea. It it works, right? And if you are doing, you want to do the same. I I mean, it, it it's pretty okay. However, at the same time, it is it is heavy. So uh, again, I think the, this the point. Uh, I think I I try to stress, which is that. There are some cases where you might have to use transactions, in which cases I think you must. There's no way around it. And if you you have to do it, I think either you go for WS transactions, uh, that if you don't have control over the platforms that you are talking to, or if you have control over the different parties you are talking to, yes, you can uh, go to like uh, transaction managers like Atomicas, etc. Uh, but remember that it is expensive, right? Uh, so let me take one last 
the if you use dedicated databases for each service, yes, you will create a lot of you might create a lot of databases, right? And uh, you might end up with redundant data. So I think that's a trade-off. However, if you are sharing data through the so as the, the the real problem is that if you sh if if one service depends on data written by the other service and so on and so forth, which create the tighter coupling. I think that's the point that you want to avoid. But again, it's a trade-off that there are uh, bad things. I mean, there are uh, you there are some disadvantages in doing that as well. So uh, I'll stop there, but we can uh, please drop a mail uh, if we didn't answer any of the questions, and uh, uh, we will happy to discuss more. Uh, Osama, over to you. Oh, sorry, actually. Uh, so we have we have a few more webinars coming on the same series. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, uh, hope, thanks. To, uh, hope to talk to you again. Okay, thank you. Thanks from my side too. Have a good time.